Welcome to Share Views with my co-host Stefania Barbaglio from Cassiopeia Services and our very special guest, uh, an expert on the world of cryptocurrencies or what is it cryptocurrencies, cyber currencies? Uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, Michael Hudson, CEO of BitStocks. How are you today, Michael? Very good, thank you. Yourself? I am uh, buzzing with excitement to learn about uh, this area, which I know practically nothing about. Uh, I will admit to that. But um, where do we start with uh, Bitcoin and BitStocks and all, the, all this sort of world here? Okay, probably best place to start is why we're involved in it in the first place as a company and myself. Um, so my journey is quite similar with many people in Bitcoin. Okay, First time I came across Bitcoins, best part three and a half years ago, completely dismissed it, absolutely dismissed it. Right? I thought it's something to do with maybe what kids are playing around with online, a bit of a fad, online digital currency, magic money. I, I didn't take it seriously. And it's only really months after I originally came across it, the value of Bitcoin absolutely skyrocketed. And that made me look into it. So I read the white paper, i had done a lot more research as to what Bitcoin was, what it's all about. And my background is very tech-centric as well as a uh, very strong financial background. My first interest was the technology side of me. Okay? I had to satisfy the geek in me to understand what this is all about. So as soon as I read into Bitcoin and I began to understand it, one of the first things that truly dawned on me that, one, this is not just a currency. Okay? To call Bitcoin just a currency is almost like saying your iPhone or your Android phone, the only purpose of that piece of technology is it allows you to make and receive telephone calls over long distances, right? But as we all know, you can do a variety of different applications on that same piece of technology. Okay, so just to tarnish it as just a means of voice communications over long distances misses the point. Bitcoin is very, very, very similar in the aspect. So as soon as I understood it from a technical standpoint, the financial side of me started to rise up. So, okay, well, potentially you can make a fortune if, if you dedicate your professional career to this. But wait a minute, right. what is it, what's the value? I mean, you, somebody just one day just created a coin or mm -hmm. created a currency, or uh, what is it? Okay, so in order, there's been many different attempts of creating alternatives to the pre-existing financial system. Bitcoin was not the first digital currency. I would even argue today the US dollar, the GBP are digital currencies. Only 3% of, uh, of the money supply is actually physical, right? So they are digital currencies. However, these are digital currencies that are centralized, uh, run by a particular establishment or government, et cetera, okay, as subject to, as of what we've seen, uh, instabilities and potentially manipulation. corruption. Manipulation, right? So in order to circumvent all of this and create a different version uh, of, of, of money, you need to do one which is completely decentralized, one that is not a company, one that is not an individual, somebody who cannot have a gun pointed at him, a company that can't be, can't be actually regulated out of existence, and a few challenges come along with that. So in Bitcoin, it was the first time ever that we've actually managed to create a digital system okay, which doesn't require a centralized actor. Okay. So what that means is, is that if the banks no longer issue this currency, okay, and if there isn't PayPal or a mediator in the middle to process these transactions, okay, and there isn't a government to back the currency, where does it get its value from? Why is this even valuable? Okay. Now, the real genius thing about Bitcoin is the way in which it's governed. Okay, so these are three big, huge issues that had to be resolved before Bitcoin had any viability. How do you process transactions without a yeah. centralized actor? How do you issue new currency without a central bank? Okay, then how do you provide security without government backing? Okay, so what Bitcoin uh, has resolved in, in doing this, and this actually links into Bitcoin miners and the mining process and how Bitcoin is actually secured, is basically this. Okay, so there are there's an algorithm within Bitcoin, okay, which links into the mining process, which basically says this. You have special actors in the Bitcoin uh, community called Bitcoin miners. They run specialized software on a, piece of, on a computer, okay, and they effectively donate that computer to the Bitcoin network. Okay. By donating that computer to the Bitcoin network, they're allowing their computer to process transactions on behalf of the Bitcoin network. So that's how we circumvent the fact that we don't need PayPal or a mediator to do transactions. Okay. But Michael, how do you do this transaction? How do I spend Bitcoin, for instance? Uh, I'm just getting onto that. Right, so you process transactions, okay, uh, on behalf of the network. And the second one is, is the fact that how do you actually have new currency come into issuance? Why, why are you even performing that function in the first place? Why are you donating your computer, expensive piece of uh, equipment, to perform this function? Okay. Well, the way that new money comes into existence is, and the reason why one of the underlying technologies of Bitcoin is called a blockchain, 
okay, is because all of these transactions are bundled up into batches. Okay? In Bitcoin's case, they're 10-minute batches or 10-minute blocks are what they're called. Okay? So you've got all of these special actors called Bitcoin miners performing this function. Okay? The reward to perform this function is that every single 10 minutes, a certain amount of Bitcoins comes into existence, which is predefined from day one. Okay? When it began, there were 50 Bitcoins being paid out as a reward to these special actors called Bitcoin miners to perform this function. Okay? Roughly every four years, that gets halved. So it went to 25 Bitcoins, and then recently this year in June, it went down to 12 and a half uh, Bitcoins, which is why Bitcoin, in Bitcoin, I can accurately predict 10 years from now, 50 years from now, and even 100 years from now, what the actual rate of issuance of currency and how much currency will actually be in circulation in Bitcoin. So what we have from day one is a monetary system that is designed from day one to be deflationary by design. Yeah. That is where a lot of the comparisons between Bitcoin and gold originate from. The fact that it's limited and you have a limited store of value. Okay. So the last part is, is that, okay, so that's transactions, that's currency issuance. Where does the security come from? Okay. Why, why, why would we trust this new digital form of money? Because as soon as we take anything from the physical realm and we put it into the digital realm, it's very easy to, to uh, copy, yeah. right? How do you know that if I come into your store, if you own a coffee store and yeah. I buy a cup of coffee with yeah. Bitcoin, that I won't go to your competitor next door and use that same money to yeah. buy another cup of coffee from a competitor? How do you prevent that? Yeah. And also right? banks, are, do they feel confident you know, to welcome Bitcoin yet? Or do you think it's too early um, for this transition? Well, every major bank in the world right now is working on this technology or an adaptation uh, of this technology. Okay, I think that the banks right now are taking this technology fairly seriously, but at the same time, you've got to put it into perspective. Okay, collectively, this whole ecosystem, Bitcoin and all the alternative currencies, which are in excess now of 700 alternatives to Bitcoin, have a collective market cap of around about 14 billion dollars. Okay, to a bank, a, a, an investment bank, or a large hedge fund, or, or, or your governments, 14 billion dollars it doesn't even really register. Okay, so they acknowledge it as a interesting technology and a very disruptive technology. Mm -hmm. But I think at the same time, perhaps to their own detriment, and I'm very com confident, maybe to their own detriment, they're not necessarily taking it. Uh, yeah, that seriously. right. That if, if Bitcoin was successful, banks and uh, central banks would be out of business. I mean, they, they wouldn't. They would have nothing to do. I don't believe banks and central banks will necessarily be, a, be out of business. I don't think Bitcoin's place is to completely abolish and replace the banking system. It is going to shake it to its core, though. Okay? And we've seen many examples of this happen. Okay? When the internet was invented, what was a pre-established uh, industry in which the internet trod on? It was the telecommunications yeah. industry. Okay? And what you had in the telecoms industry is you had some players, the large players, who were unwilling to adapt. Okay? They wanted to put out their competitive advantage to the internet, which was the colored fax machine. That was genuinely the response uh, to the internet okay, by some uh, telecoms companies. Okay? Then you had a couple, a very large telecoms company who were forward thinking. AT&T, prior to the internet, was the largest telecoms company in America. BT, prior to the internet, was the largest telecoms company here in the UK. Both respectively, in their own jurisdictions, are the largest internet service providers. Uh, in their jurisdictions now, okay? That's a perfect example of a company who has adapted and now taken their telecoms infrastructure and put it on top of the internet in the form of voice over IP and now doing internet service uh, offerings, okay? I think exactly the same thing is going to happen in banking. I don't think banking is going to be abolished by this technology, but what will happen, and a trend that I can see uh, happening, is that instead of your local bank being a physical branch built out of bricks and mortar, it's just going to be application on your mobile phone. Yeah. Can we come back to the security angle? And can Absolutely. we expand the, that a little bit more? Yeah, so just to finish the point that I was making on security. So if all of these uh, special actors are performing this function, okay, in order to process the transaction, they're all competing uh, for this reward of Bitcoins that gets paid out every single uh, 10 minutes. What that does to the Bitcoin uh, network is it pulls all of the resources from these Bitcoin miners who are performing this function. So collectively, you have this big, huge juggernaut of computational power. Okay? So the only way to invalidate a Bitcoin transaction or to corrupt the network okay, is to have more processing power than all of these special actors combined, okay? which right now, to give an example, if you take all of Google's computing power, combine it together, times it by 5,000, 
It's nowhere near more powerful than the Bitcoin network. You take the top 500 supercomputers in the world, combine their computational power, times that by 1,000, it's still nowhere near more powerful than the Bitcoin network. There is not enough computational power in even the US government's hands right now to break the Bitcoin network. All right, just to, so, to go on to what Bitstock does again, and this sounds, sounds like a, not, not exactly a simple area to understand. Mm -hmm. Where do you come in and you know, how do I uh, use your services, etc.? Okay, so <coughs> linking back to my personal journey, is when I was going out into the marketplace trying to find uh, opinions on Bitcoin, okay, if you speak to an engineer, an engineer is going to give you an amazing breakdown as to what Bitcoin is from a technological standpoint. Okay? If, you're, if you are very technologically minded, then the words which are going to be used in that explanation more than likely not, aren't, are not going to go over your head. But to the average individual, you go and speak to a, a, a computer engineer and ask them about Bitcoin, you're not going to walk away having a good firm understanding as to what Bitcoin's all about. Also, a large amount of these individuals might not have a very good uh, economic understanding. So you're not getting a full comprehensive uh, overview. And also, Bitcoin as well is quite political. So then you're missing out on the po political side of things. If you speak to a financial professional, they may, if it's, for instance, an investment banker, they may have a very biased, uninformed uh, opinion of Bitcoin, not from uh, a place of an agenda-driven an agenda place. They just might not truly understand what Bitcoin's all about from a technical aspect. So you're going to have quite a biased financial uh, perspective. So what I wanted to do, because there's no comprehensive place to get a real accurate answer as to why you potentially as a Bitcoin investor should allocate your, some wealth towards this asset, okay? Because a lot of people right now who want to get involved in Bitcoin, they treat it as a pun, right? My friend made a lot of money investing in Bitcoin. I heard this story that someone had $27 yeah. of Bitcoin, forgot about it, and next minute is buying a million dollar apartment, okay? So you have what we call fear of missing out syndrome, right? So what we wanted to create at Bitstocks is take those same potential investors who are approaching us for a little bit of a punt, take them through a whole educational process so they truly understand what Bitcoin is all about, and they go from being somebody who wants to take a punt to now somebody who has the right mindset to be a long-term Bitcoin holder because Bitcoin is fairly volatile, right? So if you don't have the right psychological profile to understand what this industry is, where this industry is going, why you should actually be invested in it, you're going to be the first investor that sells your portfolio as soon as the market takes a little bit of a sneeze. So what we do at Bitstocks is we've got two sides to the business. We have the market advisory uh, service, which is educating investors as to what Bitcoin is. We get your entry to market. We manage your portfolio for you, okay? And we do a revenue share for those services. And then we have our execution only desk, people who know uh, everything about Bitcoin. They just want to get exposure in a safe way, in a safe manner. Don't want to go to a public exchange because many of the public exchanges, more than likely or not, need to make a compromise between speed and efficiency and security, right? So many traders, large traders, uh, or professional institutions would rather use an over-the-counter service provider such as uh, us at Bitstocks and get exposure in that way so their cash isn't just sitting on the exchange or their Bitcoins aren't just sitting on the exchange. Um, so that very much as it stands right now is, is Bitstocks' is business model. It's really helping educate investors, holding their hands throughout the, the cryptocurrency marketplace. Bitcoin moves very quickly. The industry as a whole moves even quicker. Um, so we have our eyes and ears very close to the ground and we're always keeping our clients uh, up to date. Michael Hudson, CEO of BizTalks, thank you very much for coming in today. Thank you very much. Much appreciate your views. See you next time.